I'm so excited that you wrote this book. It's so important and I've been devouring it all week and I want to hear all about it and what led to you writing it. Um, I'm delighted to hear you've been devouring it. Um, what led to me writing it is I've been working with some of the ideas in the book for some time. Um, but as I had this experience that many authors have, which is that you only begin to understand what you've been doing in retrospect as you look back and start putting some things together. And kind of like when you look back, it looks continuous, but when you look out progressively, you, you think you're talking about this or that. And, and part of what I thought that I was beginning to write a book about the concepts of traumatophilia and the concept of traumatophobia, uh, which I'm sure we'll say more about, I'll say more about soon. But kind of like what I realized is that really I was writing a book about ethical sadism and about recouping the notion of sadism from the, the, the clutches of... Um, like thinking of it as monstrosity or destructiveness, which is the way that psychoanalysis has really grappled with it. And in the course of basically following where the book was taking me, um, kind of like without my consent, but in accord with my desire, um, I found myself in a territory of exploring sadism in a way that I, I couldn't have anticipated from the start and which, you know, in, in looking back, it makes complete sense why I would have ended up there. And in the course of that exploration, I, I made contact with disciplines and ways of thinking that I had some of which I had been really immersed in before, like, you know, in my graduate training, I did my doctoral dissertation on the Marquis de Sade. Um, so that was not new to me. Um, but many ways of thinking about sadism and theorizing it from other philosophical perspectives, I really had to immerse myself in to be able to do the work that I do in the book. Um, and I ended up in a way stumbling upon something that is quite provocative. There's many things in this book that are both provocative and controversial, but, but in a good way, I think, uh, or I hope. Um, and I ended up stumbling against uh, some of the, what my book I think is really about, what that's a, what's at the heart of um, thinking about sexuality beyond consent, which is not just about sex per se, but also about a varieties of other kinds of um, experiences at, at, at the beating heart of this book. So it sounds like the process of the writing of the book was kind of similar to the processes that you're talking about in the book. Absolutely. Absolutely. It felt extremely overwhelming to work on the book in ways that felt both torturesome and very exciting at times, both um, exhausting, um, really inciting, inciting me to go further. Um, and also, like, kind of like in some ways, I, I had to, I realized at some point I had to really give myself over to where the book needed to go, as opposed to take it where I thought it was going, uh, which was going to be much, a much shorter path than what I ended up traveling on. That's amazing. I love that. That means it's a real work of art. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happens. <laughs> anguish, I would say anguish and pleasure, which is very much what this book also talks about um it, it, it's interesting you say a work of art because i'm very preoccupied in this in this book um i'm, I'm very preoccupied with a particular work of art that basically takes up a, a couple of chapters and all of my life uh, is taken up with that work of art during the course of working on the book um and that is jeremy o'harris's slave play which i'm sure we'll be talking about much more and something happened to me in my encounter with that work of art that that stunned me in a way that I had not expected and which forced me into paths that I would not have chosen um, but which nevertheless I, I traveled down and gave myself over to and really interesting things happened in my thinking and what I started observing and also like in how my work, my clinical work shifted uh, while I was working on the book and it's really changed the way I work clinically. That's so interesting. Will you say a little bit more about Slave Play? I have not experienced it. Mm. I love that you describe it as a play that you have not experienced as opposed to a play that you haven't seen, uh, which is what most people think of uh, art as. Um, I had a really interesting experience with Slave Play. I was taken to see it for the first time um, by somebody who read a review and thought, oh, Avie would love this and gave me gave me the gift of a ticket as, as a Christmas gift. Um, 
and was able to respect the way that I like um, being exposed to art, which is by knowing nothing about it. So I didn't know anything about the play. Uh, I hadn't read any reviews. I, I never liked to read reviews. And I remember watching it the first time and feeling really um, startled and really absorbed by it. And I remember like at the end of the closing scene, feeling like really uh, chilled in my chair um, and overwhelmed and also with my mind running a mile a minute, but also it feeling like however much my mind worked, it wasn't going to grasp anything. That that to me felt immediately like really beyond the point. So in many ways, what I what I like to say is that when I watched Slave Play, I had an experience. Um, but not an experience of something. I mean, I can certainly tell you what I felt or what I thought, but that would really miss the point. And what, what that put in motion was something that I never expected and actually I haven't had an experience of before, which is that I became pretty obsessed with a play. Um, I started watching it again and again. I, I started, um, you know, the, the play started reappearing in different iterations on Broadway, uh, then moved to Los Angeles, where I also went and saw it, and now it's going to Ohio, and I'm going there again to watch it again, again, multiple times. And I, I didn't know that what was just a need to experience it again would develop into a method. Um, in some ways, I would say that it wasn't a method from the start. It's only in retrospect that I have started putting together what I was doing as um, kind of like creating something, creating a series of thoughts and understandings. Um, but mostly it was an experience of being exposed to something that um, one can never be prepared for in oneself, experiencing strange things and surprising things about um, kind of like in, in the contact with art. And that's that's what interests me about art, not what it stimulates in us. Like usually we, we look at art thinking of, oh, like, why did this appeal to me? What interior part of my psychology or my past or this unformulated um, kind of like history that has not yet been put into words? What does it call up? What does it light up in oneself? And while this is certainly one way of relating to art, I'm more interested in the ways in which art acts upon us um, and how we are arrested by it and rather than trying to understand what is it about it that touched us. Um, and I think that that puts us in a very different domain that is much more like the kind of psychoanalysis I practice um, than, um, um, than the kind of psychoanalysis that I was in many ways taught to practice. Uh, so it really like for me, art and psychoanalysis really kind of like came together in this um, like a radical exposure to a play that was really bizarre and really strange and really fascinating and which created tremendous intensities in the audiences that saw it and in the critics that started writing about it uh, almost um, kind of like we're magnetized to it. I love that and I absolutely totally get this intersection between like psychoanalysis and creative arts in this way and definitely see psychoanalysis as more of a creative practice because of this like similarity of experience in it like work the artwork like working on you in that way and um, those are the kinds of artworks that I'm drawn to as well surprise <laughs> and, uh, and I feel like the the art that's like too conceptual um and like I don't want the artist's ego to be saying too much to me you know it's like I want them to be working like from their unconscious and I want them to like also not have realized what they were doing or saying until kind of after coup as well after the fact like that's the kind of art that I really love um and I never read like reviews about things either I just like to go and experience it and if so, if the art like draws something on me like that then I'll learn about the artist or like you know go read about it and, and learn about when it was made and the context of things like that if it if it if it inspires me to do that but I don't want to do that ahead of time that's like ruins everything for me that's so interesting I have I have a very similar preference for how I am exposed to art as opposed to consuming art I also become very interested in reading things after the fact uh, but I feel less tainted by somebody else's impressions or expectations or trying to um, kind of like possess something ahead of time 
Absolutely. The art, the art, the exhibit that left me kind of the way you're describing, though I didn't follow it around, but I did go to it multiple times when it was in New York was when Francis Bacon was at the, it was at the Met and mm-hmm. they had like, I think it was like 52 or 53 Francis Bacon paintings. Mm-hmm. And it was just like, I just like, I mean, I knew, I already knew about Francis Bacon, of course, but I just like left like completely stunned and I was like wandering around Manhattan for like an hour before I realized I was like where am I going like I didn't even know what was happening anymore I was like completely disoriented it was so wonderful this experience like it's interesting you use the word disoriented because experiences of disorientation are not experiences that we're trained as analysts to appreciate or value like in fact if anything what we're trained to do is become oriented or helping the patient become oriented and I think that really under under um, um, appreciates the importance of uh, disorientation and of disruption in in kind of like psychic life and in the analytic setting. Uh, it's it's because of slave play and the work that I ended up doing um, around it, the work on myself, which was again not in order to grasp something or organize something, but to continue to remain open to being thrown into it. It's, it's really changed the way that I think about psychoanalysis. I, I think of it now more as entering an adventure uh, rather than entering a process by which one understands oneself or makes the unconscious conscious, which is how many analysts speak about uh, the clinical situation. Um, yeah, and I really appreciate how you describe it in your book. And um, yeah, much I, I, I'm completely the same way in my work. Like I was trained to do this like interpretation and find these patterns and you're doing this because of this happened to you and da, 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 da. and like, I don't do that at all. <laughs> like it's, I totally see the psychoanalytic process as like, you know, opening up possibilities. Like you talk about like opening up questions, not like locking things down into place. You know, we do that. I think we do that enough already, you know? <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, you know, in this, I'm very, very influenced by by the writings of Jean Laplanche, who is the psychoanalyst that I work with primarily in this book, him and Dominique Scarfone, um, who, who have a really kind of like intense commitment to thinking of analysis as something that is more, less synthetic and more about leases, which is the Greek word for un, kind of like unlinking, delinking. Um, but these kinds of processes are not soothing and they're not um, settling they're certainly not containing um, and they take as the, kind of like they take as their originary uh, their starting point like a certain kind of aesthetic I think this is where psychoanalysis comes together with art and with artistic practice there's an aesthetic to exposing yourself to something at the limits of what you can understand um, as an analyst before we even get to kind of like what it's like to be in it as a patient which we all have also been um, and that takes a particular kind of sensibility and I think a particular kind of cultivated uh, relationship. Um, and what I mean by cultivated relationship is it requires a bending of one's will, um, which is not the same thing as the exercise of will or willfulness. Um, um, kind of like, how do you, like, for example, uh, kind of like how do you engage with something that you know will upset you or, or might be difficult or might be exciting in ways that it shouldn't be exciting or that we're told produces affects that we're told it should not produce so other than slave play I work in the book with um, the night porter um, which is a really interesting and also very controversial film in its time which tracks the relationship between an SS officer and um, um, a, a person who is a woman who is um, kept in the camps on account of her um, re- and not religious beliefs and not uh, of her Jewishness, but on account of her being Italian and her political beliefs. So it it kind of like scrambles a little bit the Holocaust story, which is not in this case about Jewishness, but they meet in the camps and then they end up meeting again haphazardly um, later in life after um, the camps have been taken apart and they enter this kind of like really torrid affair which is both erotic and also saturated in trauma um and and the film just like slave play um and just I think as the psychoanalytic situation brings up questions about what it's like to develop intimacies around sites of trauma 
which is not the way that we usually think of trauma. Um, Absolutely. Maybe you should talk a little bit about the difference between traumatophobia and traumatophilia. I, um, you know, the, the word traumatophilia comes from the work of Jean Laplanche. Um, and um, he takes it from Carl Abraham. And there's a couple of like different accent points throughout psychoanalytic history when people use the term. But even Laplanche, who does the most with it, does actually very little with it. Um, what he kind of like raises, which I think is very important, is the way in which um, kind of like trauma can also be a, 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 that we are in a way drawn to trauma. Um, he talks about how trauma can um, kind of like have some relationship to energies that have been stalled getting reanimated. But he doesn't say very much about that. And you have to know Laplanche really well to be able to discern what he's doing with that, that he's not, it usually appears as a throwaway line. There is no paper where he discusses uh, traumatophilia. So I was really inspired by this work and started kind of like really delving into it. And then once, once you see it, you kind of, it's impossible to unsee it. The ways in which trauma is not just something that we are driven to get rid of or resolve, even though that impulse is certainly very human and very um, understandable. But we're also really drawn to trauma. Um, we're, we're drawn to the sites that have wounded us and that have hurt us and that have been difficult. And classical psychoanalytic theory will tell you that that's repetition compulsion, that there's some way in which you have become overly affected to that. And the point is to kind of like release that problematic pathological connections so that you can be free to stay away from trauma as one well should. But that doesn't accord with life or what we observe um, in, in the clinic. Um, so I became very interested in thinking, um, um, in thinking about kind of like what our relationship to trauma is as a discipline and began to discern that kind of like something that now seems obvious to me, but it took some time to kind of like flesh out, which is that there's many ways in which psychoanalysis is what I call traumatophobic, meaning that it treats trauma that has already happened as something that needs to be cleansed and something that needs to be cleared out and something that needs to be resolved or worked through or healed, or kind of like we, we know from Lowold and much work that has been done since Lowold, like the idea of like turning ghosts into ancestors as if, trauma's ideal um, resolution is to be put in the past where it belongs so that you can keep going. Um, and I, ca I can get very delightfully nerdy with you about that if you want to go in that direction about how I think that developed. But the main point is that I think that that's just one paradigm and we have not been able to see it as a paradigm because we have been so enamored with this notion that with this fantasy, with this wish, the trauma is something that can be put in the past. And what I'm working with in this book is like what sexuality beyond consent argues is that one can never get rid of one's trauma. And as an analyst, I would say, I have never seen anybody be cured of their trauma or be able to resolve it completely. And it's in the past and, um, and you, you never have to deal with it again. Trauma kind of like pops up and sometimes people kind of like are magnetized to revisiting those traumata and we just don't have a way of thinking about it. That way of thinking about it um, from that angle, which we don't have, is what I propose in the book. Um, kind of like, so I'm, I'm arguing um, for the importance of becoming kind of like theoretically more traumatophilic, of becoming more interested, not in how to get to make trauma disappear, but to become interested in how trauma appears before us again and again, and to become more curious about what subjects do with their trauma, um, which right now, anytime that somebody does something with their trauma, it's either something to be cured or fixed, um, like somebody kind of like should not be having relationships of intimacy or sexual relationships around their trauma, as for example, somebody who has been raped and then is interested in doing um, <clears throat> Uh, play, um, play rape trauma, play uh, sexual play around, um, play or kind of like engaging perversely around these kinds of experiences. And I say perversely with a lot of awareness that perversion is a, is a problematic category, but also with a lot of commitment to recouping the term perversity. Um, 
because it's where the intensity of trauma arises and it's also where the intensity of inspiration and of life arises uh, and of liveliness and kind of like when we push up against the limits. Um, and I, I think that like, I'm, I'm curious about what would happen if we began thinking traumatophilically uh, and we began to become less invested in trying to make bad things that have happened disappear as if we could as if that's possible exactly <laughs> right like is, is it possible like i don't think so but i think we're telling ourselves and we're telling our candidates and we're telling our patients implicitly that it is like you know every time we promise a patient that they don't have to live this way or they don't have to struggle with that even though we know like we know through our theories of transference, the trauma never goes away. It always kind of like reappears and it flares up in the relationship with the analyst. Even a well-analyzed patient we would not be surprised because somebody who has had a really good treatment and is really committed and has the resources, emotional resources, I'm not just talking about financial resources and temporal time resources um, to engage in a deep treatment. Like that, that's not going to wipe away the past. So the question is, how do you live with the past? And what traumatophilia argues is that the question here is not about eliminating trauma, but transforming it and turning it into something else. Yeah, exactly. And what people do with it. And like you point out in the book, all of this is really like the kernels of it begin in Freud and he kind of rewrites it himself, but like he at first lays it all out there um, and engages with trauma and masochism and sadism and voyeurs and exhibitionism. And all this is part of uh, polymorph polymorphous perversity and infantile sexuality. And then he kind of, you know, plays, wipes over things and puts them in little neat categories, <laughs> but the kernels are all right there. Mm -hmm, for sure. And, you know, like ego psychology takes it in a very bound direction in a very particular way. But I would say that other forms of more progressive psychoanalytic thinking have also done something similar. They've just done it differently. I think that, you know, the relational thinking is not innocent of that. Uh, neither is interpersonal work or schools of thought that are ostensibly more expansive. Uh, I think that part of what Kind of like I was startled to realize is that traumatophobia runs throughout the analytic canon. Um, and this attitude of um, finding ways to, or trying to find ways to get rid of trauma has actually sedimented throughout the Adam psychoanalytic, um, kind of like throughout psychoanalytic thinking. Um, I, I think that that's partly because kind of the, the alternative can be very frightening. So one of the things that I, I talk about in the book is that uh, it, we appreciating finding trauma in art or in painting or poetry or music where transformed, it's kind of like it can have the poignancy of trauma, but it's it's more um, energetically settled. Kind of it's, it's energy goes towards creativity. And I have a very big um, critique um, in some ways, like at times even a temper tantrum uh, against the notion of creativity and the way in which it argues for a desexualization um, of psychic energies, which means that they also can become very stalled and put into the capitalist production machine. And of like we can we can think of certainly art has been subject to that problem. Um, and th this is where sex becomes very, very important in this book. Um, part of what makes, the two, the play and the film that I work with so complicated is that they are playing with trauma in the domain of the sexual. This is what also makes them very controversial because kind of like there's nothing innocent or recoupable around somebody doing race play or somebody doing Holocaust trauma play uh, and engaging around this traumata. And I think this is where the rubber hits the road with thinking about where trauma appears. And that's why I choose these very challenging and I, I knowingly very product, pro, um, produ not productive, uh, provocative examples, precisely because they don't let you get away with saying, well, but you know, at the end you have like a really beautiful sculpture that captures the, the pain and the anguish. No, you end up with something else and it's not always 
um, possible to um, turn into something that is productive. You can't you can't get out of that through productivity. Um, yeah, but this is what people do. People do work with their trauma in sex, <laughs> with their sexuality. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And I love how you talk about like with attachment theory and how problematic is they're like, okay, it's okay to do BDSM and this as long as it's like in this safe relationship. Da, 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 da. It always comes back to this kind of, yeah, like safety around it. It has to have the safety or like you talk about, you know, giving verbal consent for everything, but you can't just like name every single thing that you're giving consent for because you might not know what you what you're wanting or needing you know and you have to allow space for that yeah I mean the book starts out with a very interesting vignette from a patient that I'd like to, to speak about here briefly um if that's okay with you um, sure. um it starts out with a vignette from a patient who is telling me about an encounter that she's having with her lover and she she and her lover have negotiated um, kind of like a, a scene, so to speak, where her lover will slap her. And the lover slaps her. And my patient has told me that this is a scene that we have discussed throughout the analysis many, many times. Um, the, the, my patient feels extremely um, moved by the slap. She says it was the right, exactly the right force, the right part of my face, Everything was right about that slap. And it overwhelms her so much, not because she didn't agree to it or because she didn't like it or because it was too violent, but because it met her at the core of her being in a way that is too much to bear. And she safe words. She stops the scene, not because she didn't want this, but because she wanted it so much. So the, the book starts out with this like very unexpected example. Like usually we understand safe words or kind of like limits as having to do with protecting the self from experiencing something that one did not want. But here's an example of experiencing something that one very much wanted. And that feels overwhelming. And so it, the, the, like the first chapter of, of sexuality beyond consent, actually the introduction starts out with this really unusual iteration of Kind of like what consent means and what we think it means and what we want it to mean and that we have no idea what we're talking about in these or rather the ways that we talk about consent is extremely impoverished right now it has to do with boundaries it has to do with kind of like the other respecting what we don't want which of course should absolutely happen but that doesn't take into account the, the kinds of consent that i think are kind of like right in the psychoanalytic situation like if if a patient came in and said, I never want to talk about my trauma and we forever respected that, the treatment would go nowhere. But also we don't just talk, start talking about their trauma when the patient is not ready. So there's something there, a different kind of consent that we need that is not the affirmative consent and which I describe as a more queer kind of consent that I call limit consent in the book that has more to do with what happens when one starts coming up against the limits in oneself, not against the limits in the other person. Like, when, for example, in this case, when the patient safe word that her lover completely stopped. So the issue there was not about the other person respecting or disrespecting boundaries. That was not in question. What was in question was what happens when one encounters something in oneself that one was unprepared for. Um, and the book is in some ways an exploration of what makes it possible to start risking experiences at the border of one's consent that are not, um, that one did not um, expect, but which one, which one signed up for anyway, without quite knowing what they were signing up for. Uh, for example, um, you know, like the play that I was talking about, slave play, um, the, just to give like a short summary for our listeners who may not be familiar with the play, the the play with all the spoiler alerts that this comes with, and I, I hate to talk about the play to people who have not seen it because it kind of like destroys the experience of it. So I hope that whoever has not seen it and wants to see it can pause here and come back to it again after they've seen the play. But the, the, the play... Um, unfolds on, on, on a seeming plantation where kind of like dyads of um, um, 
white masters or mistresses and um, or white passing masters or mistresses and slaves or overseers are um, overlooking the work of enslaved people. Um, and it the scenes very quickly turn sexual in a way that is a bit confusing for the audience. And then later you come to understand that these were basically BDSM scenes. So once you understand that, you now have a different sense of what was happening. But kind of like as, as the as the introduction to the play by the playwright says, like on, on the plantation, nothing is what it seems, and then everything is what it seems. Um, so it has this quality of kind of like even when you know that this was play, race still overrides play. It cannot be. It, it plays you, and as Ariane Cruz says, it plays. We play race, and race plays us that it is at the border of one's consent, the history of, um, of like racial relations and racial oppression, especially in the United States, vis-a-vis um, -vis channel slavery, is, is, is not, does not fall under the purview of consent, nor the book argues does any sexuality. So what do you do with relations which cannot, uh, cannot survive the metric of did you agree to this or not, but answer to other kinds of um, other kinds of questions like what does it mean to want something that one should not want or how is desire informed by um, by oppression or domination or kind of like colonial relations one of the white men in the play is a British man his coloniality has everything to do with how things play out um, so this is kind of like a little bit of an Alice in Wonderland kind of situation where things begin to have different shapes and sizes than one would think. Uh, and one is really thrown into disarray. Yeah, and you talk a lot about, um, in the book as well, you address, I mean, before we started recording, I said that this book is really necessary to the discourse, and I really feel that it is, and you use the word impoverished. That's, that's the perfect word to describe the discourse around like identity politics lately has been so impoverished because it's being too simplified you know it's too simplified and it's not taking in all of the, the dynamics uh, of humans that you see in psychoanalysis and how complicated and complex we are and you know how embedded these discourses are like in our own identities um, and so you can't just like you know CBT like think your way out of it like I'm not going to be like this anymore I'm going to you, know, you can do the cognitive work and you try to be anti-racist and of course we want everybody to have their rights and everything but it's like it's not that simple just to like force people's hand to like no you have to think a different way these these things are so deeply embedded and it really addresses that as well um, and how important the, the, the way you address it is. I, I appreciate you you flagging that about the book because one of the book's theoretical arguments is that um, is that uh, the isms that our societies are plagued by, racism, um, heterosexism, uh, tra um, transphobia, homophobia, these kinds of phobias are not um, experiences that we have from the world that are then layered upon a self that is kind of like unalloyed by these, but that in fact our very self is made through these. And I, I have kind of like several pages uh, in chapter one where I describe how I see that through Laplanche's theory, but without getting too bogged down in that, what I would say is that kind of like these are not just cognitive biases or even unconscious biases that if you bring them into the light of day and you become clear about them, then you have a chance of correcting them. I mean, I know how appealing this kind of fantasy is, and I do think it's a fantasy because it also helps us imagine a way that we can get out of it. But I think that the truth is much more complicated and much more difficult, which is that these are baked into the very ways that we understand ourselves, which by which I mean kind of like that the ego itself is glued together through these kinds of prejudices and inequities, which means that understanding them will not necessarily help you to get rid of them. It, it may make you feel more ashamed or more aware that they're there, but these are libidinal investments. We are invested and bound and organized through these ideas. So nothing less than our becoming undone is required for any of that without really undergoing a crisis. This is really about being thrown into a, a whirlwind 
uh, from which you may come out transformed in a good way or in a not good way. Um, so the, this is certainly, this book is certainly not a how-to and it is not a manual for how to have these experiences or how to manage these experiences. But it is, but it is very invested in, in explaining that the, the, the way that I say this, which is that identity is really the low, very, very low hanging fruit of how to attend to difference. Um, and, and a very seductive low hanging fruit, precisely because it feels like it's within one's reach. Um, that's a beautiful way to put it um yeah because I've definitely been feeling frustrated with all the discourse around it but I couldn't figure out <laughs> how to articulate it so it's nice that you did um mm. but you can see it like you said with like white tears like people like people's identity it feels like they feel like their identity is at stake when they're persecuting mm -hmm. others you know like they they have a stake in keeping maintaining the status quo because their identity is so based on it yeah and and I think this is a great example because here's here's the tricky part. The the person who's shedding white tears is also genuinely distressed. Like it's not just a, a like when we say this is just about this person trying to preserve their privilege, it that is very much true. But that doesn't make it any more emotionally, any less emotionally um, uh, vibrant. So the question is. Kind of like this is why sadism is so important in this book and something that I came to see myself as I was saying earlier very late in the process that kind of like there's a certain kind of sadism in um not a destructive sadism I think actually a very ethical necessary kind of sadism that's involved in being exposed to the fact that you actually will not get to keep who you are if you want to change and become kind of like um I don't want to say anti-racist because even that implies that one can become that. And I think that that's something that has to be constantly wrested from oneself, against oneself. That That's what I would call the bending of the will um, and your investment in your own self-preservation. Um, and I'm not talking here about masochistically, like always like kind of like trying to step back so that others can take space, which is also important, but I think ultimately insufficient. I think it's more about being willing to to let your yourself be destroyed um, by yourself, not by. Um, we hear a lot of people today talk about oh, like all of this kind of like wokeness um, is kind of like um, making everybody feel paranoid or everybody's being attacked. Um, so we hear these kinds of rhetorics around what is being asked of white people or what is being asked of cis people um, and what these leave out is that that destruction comes from within the self it doesn't come from another it comes from one's willingness to be broken down and that broken down is not does not feel good um, it doesn't come with oh look you just understood something about yourself how wonderful like what a good white person you are or what a good cis person you are it comes with of like confronting your own investments, your own um, kind of like erotic investments in, in difference and in power. This is ultimately what power is. It's a libidinal investment. Absolutely. And that's exactly why, like, for example, cis people, some cis people, you know, they feel so threatened by transness is because it, it shows something about themselves and that they're not so like, you know, cut and dry the way they imagined they were also you know so like what what is going on in you that can also be rearranged that can also be worked with um and broken down and what ways are you malleable when you thought you were so like wed to this identity that you feel is like such a core part of yourself you know mm -hmm. you know as you're talking about like being wedded to one's identity and we were talking earlier about like that little bit of investment that comes with one's identity I think it's also that's also why it's so hard to think about um, issues like transness and race in terms of erotics um, even though we see them all the time like what if kind of like you know we for example the preoccupation that cis people have with trans people's genitals like have they had the surgery like this kind of like a voyeurism what if what if we thought of that not just um, as sexual affect, which I think it very much is vis-a-vis uh, -vis trans people, but also in terms of like how one's own libidinal 
uh, bindings also get unsettled such that kind of like the erotic energies around power and power difference, certainly in race, we have a lot of difficulty thinking about that. Uh, and, and this is what race play does, um, kind of like the race play that is kind of like strewn throughout this um, this play, this theatrical piece uh, of slave play. It actually goes right for the jugular of what it's like to be libidinally invested in racial difference, which also means that kind of like there's a lot of erotics around racism and whiteness and uh, kind of like the fetish of uh, the black body that are not treated in the play and I don't treat in the book as only problematic or as evidence of where whiteness, evidence of where whiteness appears, but also sites where really complex negotiations are happening around kind of like arousal and excitement and really intense um, desires that don't line up with identity politics. And so we have in this play a couple of um, people who are black identified who are talking about kind of like wanting to be racially humiliated by white people uh, and their blackness uh, becomes a site of kind of like sexual objection in a way that is entirely um, incommensurable uh, is the word that Jose Munoz uses incommensurable with the way that we understand the need for um, equity and respect, self-respect, dignity, dignifying the other person. Um, so all of these get opened up, not in the domain of art or of kind of like more sublimated erotics, they open up in the domain of the sexual person, uh, which is why this book is so organized around sexuality and especially forms of sexuality that, that are beyond consent. Absolutely. And as far as the uh, the breakdown of identity, you know, you see that in every analytic treatment, you know, there has to be a point where people are kind of unmoored, you know, and they're like, like, they're, it's very uncomfortable. They're like, where am I? Because people are so identified with, you know, their patterns or repetitions and whatever they, whatever they came in with their symptoms. And when they're learning to kind of uh, mix that all up and break it down, you know, there's definitely a place where people are destabilized and unmoored and floating. And I always think of it as the void. They're like facing this void that they have to like, now you have to like put yourself together in a, in a different way and like move through the world in, in a bit of a different way that you haven't for, you know, how many decades you've been on this planet. Um, so yeah, it's not always super pleasant and easy <laughs> ever. <laughs> I, I would actually take it a step further and say that it's not just not super pleasant, but oftentimes when you look at it clinically, it looks like somebody's having a break or somebody's doing something that is really self-destructive or really repetitive. And I, I want to say something about repetition in this respect, which is that in, in psychoanalysis, repetition has, a, has a very bad rep, um, Kind of like it's it's um we usually see repetition as as the site where we kind of like observe that something problematic is coming up that somebody's really caught up in something like moving kind of like through the molasses of trauma by just getting stuck on it again and again and again. But part of the argument in sexuality beyond consent is that actually repetition is also a way um. um not out of it, but a way in which somebody can develop the escape velocity to do something different with trauma. So rather than repetition of the same or repetition with a difference, I'm, I'm arguing for a certain kind of practices, practices that have the kind of sadism that I was talking about earlier, the sadism towards the self, the bending of the will, um, as having the potential to create that difference, um, such that repetition is a repetition towards a difference. Um, but that is not a result that can be guaranteed. Like I, I have a very strong sense that part of why, how we see all of these um, kind of like situations, say with the raiding of the Capitol or people becoming ultra right is having undergone some kind of like rupture or crisis of the self that then gets sutured together in ways that can be really problematic. So there's nothing politically necessarily good about these kinds of crisis, they can create really um, kind of like mind expanding new selves, or they can create really fascist, it, and that space opens up to fascism, it opens up to destructiveness, it opens up to domination, 
So the, the kinds of experiences that they describe as experiences of overwhelm that can break down itself in the book are by no means guaranteed to have a good result. And I think people sense that, and that's why analysts are so afraid of them. Um, the book's argument is not that we shouldn't be afraid of them. The book's argument is that other things can come out of them as well, but we can't control that ahead of time. Many factors, including chance, which is something that we as analysts don't talk about a lot, and we should, including chance have a share in how somebody who has come undone comes back together. Um, that's a great point. And another thing that you talked about in the book, which I guess you talk about it, but I guess it also comes from Laplanche is, you know, I very much see the the libido or the sexual drive and the aggressive drive. They're the same drive in my mind. Uh, and and I don't I don't understand this, like people splitting these apart. I, I'm totally for the death drive, but it's not the aggressive drive in my mind. The death drive is just for me more just like inertia, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I love that you brought this up. It's uh it's absolutely critical. And um, I, I think I, I want to, if, should, can I say a little bit more about that, like from a theoretical perspective? Yeah. For analysts, listeners. Um, so, you know, Freud, this is Laplanche's critique. Freud started out with a theory of sexuality that had a lot of room for elements of the sexual that were not about love or care or bonding or unification or kind of like, um, uh, a, a, a sense of connection, uh, but which also had room for masochism and sadism, which were primary for Freud, and they had room for things like exhibitionism, even even cross species attraction, he calls it, kind of like basically, um, kind of like intense passions that override even kind of like the boundaries of the species. Um, and and Freud was not necessarily speaking about say bestiality, but he was talking about a certain kind of force in the in the sexual domain that was not about kind of like something that you come together with another person and you feel fulfilled. Maybe you have an orgasm and you feel good, and then you can go about like living life connected and and always in unison. Um, he he started out with a much more polymorphously perverse version of the sexual. But in the mid 1910s, he really changed his perspective and he, he cleaned out the sexual um, in a way that made the sexual become more about eros and unification and connection and um, intimacy or the capacity to experience the other as a full object. And that left us with an understanding of sexuality, which then plagued the rest of psychoanalysis. And many people have written about this, about how that has basically um, uh, kind of like hovered over psychoanalytic thinking about sexuality and love um, after Freud. What, what Laplanche adds to that is that he goes back to the moment where Freud makes that move, where he cleans out the sexual, and he says, wait a minute, like what, what is going to happen with all of that stuff that you kicked out of the sexual? Where's that going to go? Of course, he says, you're going to need a death drive because you're going to have to put it somewhere so Freud, in Laplanche's thinking, ends up with a death drive, precisely because he has done the work of domesticating too much the sexual. Now that he's taken it apart, he also has to explain to us how the two come together. Like, how do you end up with masochism? What about sadism? Is sadism primary? Is masochism primary? Like, is that part of like normal human life? Or do you end up with this because you've been traumatized or something kind of like constitutionally is off with you? So Freud starts coming up with all of these theories and he works on them for the rest of his life of trying to explain how the two come together. And Laplanche says, well, you've kind of created that problem for yourself when you made it too clean. So when you say, when you said earlier, Vanessa, but the two are not separate, that's exactly what he's talking about. He says, there is no desexualized aggression. There is no aggression that is not also sexual. And there is no sexuality that is also not kind of like, one and the same with this, with aggressivity. And that really scrambles the way we would think about consent. It kind of like, it laughs in the face of kind of like thinking about the one as separate from the other. Um, and it also in a way helps us from getting caught up in all of these um, problematic ideas about kind of like, um, about imagining that there is a domain like for example, good politics or anti-racist work that is completely free from different um, impulses uh, 
so that when we find them in somebody, that person is problematic, as opposed to this is how it works. And this is what we have to contend with, which is kind of like a much bigger problem than being able to identify it in one person who had the wrong desire or the wrong feeling or the wrong outburst. Uh, or trauma. Yes, that's right. Or trauma. Mm -hmm. what, what, what were you thinking about when you said that? Well, it's like like saying like, oh, this person is like this because they're traumatized. You know, they had this trauma and now they're going into it as if it's problematic. Is that as if that's not what we're all doing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, trauma is such an interesting concept in this way because it can get used to do a lot of dirty work. Um, and by dirty work, I mean kind of like um, the kind of like trauma is often invoked as a way of refusing to contend with how um, kind of like sinister sexuality can be um, in a way that cannot actually be cleaned out. That desire does not follow lines of, of ethics. Um, it does not follow lines of um, equality or dignity, uh, which is not to say that, well, since it then doesn't, then anything goes. But it is to say that we still have to contend with how uh, the sexual does, does not do politics the same way that politics do politics. The sexual does something else. And that's actually a good thing because it, it points us to all the elements that we don't want to be thinking about uh, when it comes to um, what's an ethical relation. Uh, how do you have like ethical um, relationships with other people across um, racial, lines of racial difference, of economic difference, of um, gender difference. Identity is not going to save us from that. We need something else. Um, and that's more about what appears when two people are before each other in, in, in the vulnerability that comes with um, that comes with um, wanting things that maybe you're not supposed to want. Uh, like for example, in, in, the, in the book, I talk about this black activist who allows me to interview him, um, who is a race player and a really prominent member of the race play community. And he has a very interesting take on how, um, on how he's kind of like what he's been told about race play, which is that he's not supposed to want it. He's not supposed, the particular kind of race play that he does is he wants to be humiliated by white women, racially humiliated. And he's on the receiving end of a lot of critique. Like people say to him, black people say to him things like, what would Malcolm think? How can you want that? Isn't that some internalized uh, black self-hatred or some complicity with whiteness? Um, and um, and white people kind of like stay as far away from it as they can. He in fact talks about how it's very hard to get any white people to play with him because nobody wants to be a racist who has these kinds of desires or will will play out these kinds of scenes. So we we can think of him as somebody who has kind of like pathology, like you know here he is playing out his trauma around race and it's just taken a sexual um, tint. Um, tent, so to speak, um, and kind of like, so we need to help this person not be self-deluded about what his desires are or should be. But he, but he, he, his name is Mike Bond, but Mike Bond has a very interesting comeback to that, which, which gave me a lot of thought and which is throughout slave play as well, which is who, who is, who is the you who's protecting me from myself? Who is the you who is to say, I shouldn't want this. And how is that not a white logic of diminishing my own agency? So central to sexuality beyond consent are also questions of agency. Like what does it mean to have an agency if we're not going to think of agency as the decision, the conscious, willful decision to do this or that? Like what, what happens to agency when we think of, of trauma and of the unconscious? Um, do, do you want to like... I would love to hear more about sadism if you want to talk about it since you wrote your dissertation on Marquis de Sade. <laughs> <laughs> I could say a little bit more about that. That would um, be wonderful. 
Sure. Um, I, I haven't yet started speaking publicly about um, this um, notion of ethical sadism, but I'll, I'll say a few things for listeners who want to get a very quick sense, and uh, one can read about it in much more depth and detail in the book. Um, but um, ethical, um, let me start with this. Like the, the word sadism is sourced from the Marquis de Sade, who was this um, kind of a like, uh, perverted aristocrat who lived around the time of the French Revolution and who actually lived most of his life either in um, confined in prison or in um, insane asylums, as they were called at the time, and who wrote, he's known for having authored a series of books uh, that appear for all intents and purposes to be pornographic, and they have content-wise, they are litanies, like exhausting, exhaustive, and ultimately boring litanies of torture, sexual torture. But what also happens in his book, which, which is very interesting, is that in the midst of um, kind of like a de the, their debauches and their orgies, the main characters begin to philosophize. And they give really interesting treatises about politics, about the power of the church, about the power of the state, and launch really fascinating critiques against um, in thinking about power, state power, and um, abuses of power. So interestingly, um, what many people don't know is that the Sad has also been very influential in political theory and philosophy. Um, and most psychoanalysts are more, more aware of his connection to sadism. But it's not, um, and up, up until I would say, up until kind of like the way that he's taken up, his works are taken up are mostly through philosophy and um, and um, kind of like thinking about the, the political implications for the settings in which these debauches unfold. Um, but something shifts around World War II and around the Holocaust, which is that now after World War II, the Saad is read quite differently. He's read as... Um, kind of like um, as, uh, whereas he used to be read as a, as a sergeant of sex and as an accountant of kind of like sexuality with all its political ramifications. Now he begins to get read as having foretold how um, kind of like how the the, uh, the the human body can get destroyed, how the human will can be broken. Um, and, and something really shifts in how he's taken up. And what we think of today when we're thinking with the Marquis de Sade is mostly this notion of destructiveness and violence. Uh, but, but there's also a certain kind of sovereignty, self-sovereignty that de Sade argues for that gets lost in this kind of like transmuted way of thinking about sadism where he is really insisting on um, aspects of uh, being in the social world that preserve once the individual's capacity to act against social codes and against what is expected of him from the religion or the state. And he introduces this notion of self-sovereignty that this is what gets lost after World War II, and which is very important because it is only from that place that one can begin to think about the bending of the will. What, what in psychoanalysis we would think of as resistance. Like if the ego is interested in preserving itself, in preserving its privileges, in preserving its integrity, in keeping itself whole so that it doesn't get ravaged by trauma. Um, and if the ego is also made, as I was saying earlier, through these um, kind of like a social um, kind of like through through if it's if it's threaded through transphobia and homophobia and racism, if that's what keeps the ego intact, breaking down the ego is going to be resisted. Um, so one of the questions that came up in the book is, how does somebody put themselves in a situation that will, against their consent, take them to an elsewhere, which they have not pre-negotiated or do not expect? How do you sign up for something that may break you down? Um, that's, that's kind of like the whole question of like limit consent. You don't sign up for it affirmatively. Uh, you, you expose yourself to something. And the question of ethical sadism is about the kinds of circumstances and conditions that 
make it possible for you to be exposed to something at the limit of what you're consenting for. For example, uh, one, of the, one of the things that I would say is that oftentimes as analysts, there's a certain kind of relationship to power that we have really struggled to not have so that we do not control our patients. But there's also a power that we do have, which is to do as much as we can as to create the conditions for a patient to marginally want to be exposed to something that is difficult. I say marginally because nobody wants to be exposed to that. And I say want because I'm also not talking about violation. The whole art of psychoanalysis is about creating that marginal wanting, which can be very difficult. Um, and I think it requires of the analyst a certain press and a certain in, in, um, investment in keeping the, the patient's feet to the fire and also her own feet to the fire that I think has something sadistic in it. I, I say that it has something sadistic because you don't know where it's going to go and you also know that the other person is going to suffer and you have to do it not because you want the other person to suffer but because you need to do what's necessary you need to do what's necessary so that kind of like you could so the patient who cries because she was called a racist um if, if all you do is talk about her pain around that um you're not going to be able to get very far at some point you need to push a little bit past that and what that requires is also you pushing a little bit past yourself because none of us, those of us who have become analysts also have like a very big investment in helping and identifications with like helping our patients and helping our internal objects and repairing injuries like people who we could not cure as children. So there's at the same time, a really big investment in being good ourselves. So keeping a patient's feet to the fire does not help with that part of the self. So in that sense, the ethical sadist also has to bend her will in order to be able to do what's necessary. Um, yeah, and, I think and that's a big difference between psychoanalysis and like the more helping therapies, psychotherapies, that like even just like not jumping in and helping them feel better. Oh, you're not a racist, you know, like not just like withholding. Um, it, you know, you know that somebody wants you to jump in and to kind of help them and be supportive and you don't do it because you know that that's what's necessary, you know. You know, it's, you know, when you say that's what's necessary, what that, it's very important to say that to, to do that thing that's necessary so to be to be ethically sadistic in this way is not about giving in to one's own kind of like sadistic impulse it's about having worked through whatever will inhibit you from actually being able to stay with that difficulty so paradoxically to be an ethical sadist requires quite a bit of psychic work rather than giving in to the impulse of being just kind of like cruel to the other, which is also a human impulse. I don't know if that makes sense, but I think it's an important distinction. It makes perfect sense. And I know you have a bunch of events coming up. Let's make sure to plug all of the events you have coming up. Thank you. Um, yeah, I have. So the book is launching on uh, February 8th. Um, it, I'm going to be in conversation with my fantastic editor, corresponding editor from the Sexual Culture series, um, uh, uh, Joshua chambers Letson, um, who's actually, I'm very happy to say, flying to New York just for this event. So I'm delighted to say that we're going to be doing that at the um, Gay Center at the Bureau for General Services Queer Division. People can find information about that on my website. Um, and that's an in-person launch uh, with some exciting surprises for whoever is going to be there in person. Um, and then there's a virtual launch uh, for people who may be in other parts of the country or different time zones, which is on the evening of um, February 9th. And there's also information about that on my site um, through Greenlight Bookstore in Brooklyn. Um, I'm going to be in conversation with um, Amber Musser, uh, a really fantastic uh, feminist theorist, and um, Tavia Nyong'o, who is uh, one of the co-editors of this series. And I'm really excited about being in conversations with these colleagues who have really helped my thinking and expanded my work. Um, and there's also a psychoanalytic launch that is going to happen in early May uh, with uh, Dominique Scafoni and Michelle Stevens. Um, Ooh, very nice. And my friend, I have a dear friend, Jason Hoff, who's my old roommate, 
Um, I have already told him that he has to go to the bureau for your oh. launch because he's going to love your book. <laughs> so if Jason Hoff says hello, I'll tell him to say hello. <laughs> Look forward to meeting him. Very cool. Is there any anything else? Um, well, there's a lot more, but I, I don't think we can fit more into this podcast. I'm, they have I'm just... to read the book. <laughs> I'm just so grateful for this conversation and for for how um, eagerly you've jumped into some really challenging ideas. So I really appreciate that and the opportunity to talk about my work. No, I was thirsty for these ideas. These are great. As soon as I, I saw the title, I was like, oh, this is going to be good. <laughs> and then it just gets better and better. Um, we were, The field really needed it. I really mean that. It was Thank great. 